These are scenarios that I've written to be used in the classroom when students role play different social psychological concepts. The first of these involves 10 students as actors and four of them have speaking roles, Bernard, Kate, Tammy, and Sue. While the other student actors wait to one side, one student, Bernard, pretends to come out of a building. He then appears to drop a small garbage bag into a nearby trash can. Kate, speaking as she walks past him, Hey, Bernard, you're up and early this morning. Bernard, turning to speak to her, Yeah, my band had a late gig last night and I haven't gotten to bed yet. Kate, well, have a good day. Bernard, starting to walk back toward his building, you too. After Kate is no longer in sight, Bernard suddenly clutches his chest and appears to be in pain. He slowly falls to the ground and lies still. The other students, except Tammy and Sue, should pretend to walk rapidly along the street. They appear to be carrying briefcases, straighten their ties, or in other ways indicating that they're going to the jobs in the morning. Some of these students glance down at Bernard while others do not even appear to see him. Then Tammy and Sue walk up to where Bernard is lying on the ground. Tammy, looking at Bernard, what's wrong with him? Sue, who knows, he's probably homeless or sleeping off a really bad night. Don't touch him. Tammy, looking closely at Bernard, hey, I don't think so. His lips are blue and he's barely breathing. Sue, well, there are plenty of people around and if this were a real emergency, I'm sure someone would help him. This scenario illustrates the bystander effect and our tendency to exhibit a diffusion of responsibility when faced with a crisis situation. A classic illustration of the bystander effect involved the murder of Kitty Genovese, who was a 28-year-old bartender who was living in Kew Gardens in Queens, New York City, and was raped and stabbed outside her apartment building with many people hearing her screams and no one in any way making an attempt to help her. Here is the second scenario illustrating social psychological concepts. In this scenario, there are eight students as actors and five speaking roles, John, Ann, Martin, Candace, and a young child named Missy. All but one student should stand in a cluster as if they're grouped together in an elevator. John and Ann stand in front of the group while Martin stands in the back where he cannot be seen. The remaining student, Candace, stands away from the others as if waiting for the elevator to come. John should indicate in some fashion that the elevator doors have opened on Candace's floor. When she enters the elevator, Candace pushes the button for the third floor while scolding her young child, Missy, for walking too slowly and making them late for the babysitter. Missy is tearful and apologetic. As Candace and Missy exit the elevator on the 34th floor, the others on the elevator see Candace give the child a shove to get the child to move faster. Anne says, I hate that. People who don't know how to treat kids shouldn't have them. John, I know what you mean. And that little girl, Missy, is really a cute kid. Some people are just rotten parents. Anne, I bet that woman does more than just shove that poor child when there's no one else around to see it. Martin, stepping forward to exit the elevator, says, I understand why you have that impression about her, but I personally know Candace, and she really is a good mother to Missy. Unfortunately, Candace's father is in the hospital, and he's going to have heart surgery today. Candace must be in a big hurry to get there and spend some time with him before the surgery begins. What social psychological concept is illustrated here? It is the fundamental attribution error because we do tend to explain other people's behavior in terms of their personality characteristics rather than as a function of the situation or the context. In the third scenario, there are 10 student actors required. Two students have speaking roles, Troy and Pamela. One student, Pamela, is alone and sitting in a desk at the front of the classroom pretending to play a piano. There are also nine desks positioned in a group at a distance from the piano, ready for an audience. As she plays the piano, Pamela pretends to make numerous errors and is clearly frustrated. After a minute or so, Troy pretends to enter the room and pauses to watch Pamela. 
Pamela looks up and notices Troy. Well, this is going to be awful. Troy, walking past the piano to exit through another door. Nah, you've practiced that musical piece over and over. You'll do fine. Pamela muttering, that's what you think. You don't have to give a recital in just a few minutes. Pamela plays the piano again, making more errors. Finally, she pretends to look up at the clock on the wall and says a swear word. Pamela, standing up and leaving the room, well, I'm doomed, but I guess I'll have to go and change my clothes anyway. The remaining students enter the room singly or in small groups. They should sit in the desks positioned for the audience, chatting with each other or pretending to read musical programs for the recital. After a few minutes, Pamela enters the room and walks over to sit at the piano. The audience becomes silent, pretending to listen as she plays. As she pretends to play, Pamela does not make any errors. At the end of the musical piece, she stands up to bow, and the audience applauds enthusiastically. Troy, sitting in the audience, I knew she would play it perfectly. So what social psychological concept is this? It would be social facilitation, because we do, quite often, with some types of activities, perform better in front of an audience. Scenario number four. Number of student actors required, 10. Four with speaking roles, Walter, Bernice, Gerald, and Charlene. The student actors for this scenario should move their desks to the front of the classroom facing sideways, arranged as if they are in class and waiting for the instructor to arrive. Their seats are positioned so that Charlene's desk is located in the back corner of the group. Walter, appearing to look at a clock on the wall in front of him, count down. Just two more minutes and we can leave. Bernice, what do you mean? Walter, if an instructor is more than 10 minutes late, we can just leave and assume that the class is canceled. Bernice, you're kidding. I didn't know that. Walter, one minute and 40 seconds left. Gerald, suppose the instructor arrives 10 minutes and just a few seconds late. Can we still leave? Walter, yeah, it's the university rule. I read about it in the school catalog. Now it's only one minute and 30 seconds left. Charlene, looking up from studying her textbook. Yeah, but we have a test today. Walter, all the more reason to leave if he is late enough. Gerald, I sure wouldn't mind not having to take the test today. Charlene, well, I studied hard for it, and I'd like to get it over with. Walter, still watching the clock. One minute and 19 seconds. Yeah, well, I didn't study, and I just want to get out of here and go home. Gerald, I don't know. Wouldn't it make him mad if he came and we weren't here? Walter, that doesn't matter. It's the rule. Charlene, well, how about being quiet and letting the rest of us study our class notes until he gets here? I want to get a good grade in this class. Walter, why bother? It's only 45 seconds left. The group remains silent for about 35 seconds while Charlene studies the notes in her notebook. Walter, suddenly shouting at one second intervals, 10, 9, 8, 7, 6, 5, 4, 3, 2, 1, we can go. Gerald, are you sure? Walter, yes, I'm sure. We just all have to agree to leave now so he won't be mad at any one of us. Do you all agree? Walter starts pointing to each student in the class, starting with Gerald and leaving Charlene to be the last. When Walter points to him, Gerald nods his head in agreement. Each student in the class then nods as Walter points to her or to him. Finally, Walter points to Charlene, waiting for her response. After a long pause, Charlene says, oh, all right. She slams her notebook shut and leaves the classroom with the other students. What vocabulary term is illustrated here? It is the ash effect or conformity, a tendency to go along with other people, even when we think perhaps they might be wrong. It is named the ash effect after Solomon Ash, who conducted the classic research regarding the social psychological phenomenon. For scenario number five, the number of student actors required is six. There are three speaking roles, Ginger, Carl, and Larry. All students except Carl should stand at the front of the class chatting in a group, as if they're at a party. Carl enters the room, looks around, and then joins the other students. Carl says, hi everybody. He looks at Ginger and says, great Dracula costume. I can't even tell you who you are in that thing. Ginger says, thanks. Your costume is terrific too. I really like the cowboy hat. Carl says, thank you ma'am. Ginger, so we're all dressed up in these great costumes. What should we do now? You guys want to go out somewhere? Larry, sure. On my way over here, I saw some other guys in costumes who looked like they were having some fun. 
Ginger, what were they doing? Larry, I don't know. I only saw them from a distance, but they had some decent music playing, and I saw some guys jumping up and down where others were yelling, go, go, go. I wondered what they were doing as I walked by them. Carl, well, let's go find out. The entire group of students should pretend to leave the party and walk a relatively long distance to a new location. Carl, there they are. Let's go join them. The group walks a short distance further. Ginger, pretending to look at some people in front of her. Wow, look at that. Carl, yeah, they're going to get in big trouble. Larry, if that were my car, I'd be pretty upset right now. Carl, no kidding, but they are wearing some pretty cool costumes. Check out the guy dressed like a robot. Ginger, now what are they doing? Larry, hey, they lit a bonfire. Carl, sarcastically. Yeah, with a park bench. Not good, man. Ginger, why are they behaving that way? Who are these people? Larry, hey, I recognize Bob Smith over there. Why would he do this stuff? He's usually such a great guy. What vocabulary term is this? Deindividuation. The idea that when we are in costumes or clothing that hides our identity or makes us more part of a group, then we are likely to behave in ways that are not characteristic of ourselves. We might engage in destruction of public property, for instance. We just engage in group activities without concern for the consequences of our actions.